Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. can still work at home remotely, please continue to work at home remotely. The plan by universities to bring people back to campus. We've already ignored social distancing guidelines and, and many of them aren't, aren't even wearing a mask. Ted James against resuming the legislative session right now. I woke up on a Friday morning at five o'clock with severe intestinal pain and a fever that was 100.9. 38 days and still not totally out of the woods. One woman's battle with COVID-19. When they were little, we used to give them little rubber bands as little reminders. An idea that gives rise to the WASH 20 wristband. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment. But first, Governor John Bell Edwards held his latest media briefing this afternoon at the state capitol. He spoke in detail about testing and contact tracing. They will be critically important because that's how we will uh, make our very best effort to be able to monitor the situation, see what's going on around the state of Louisiana, uh, go in and test hot spots, go in and test those congregant uh, settings like nursing homes and, and so forth on a more frequent uh, basis. We define close contact for the um, uh, reasons of contact tracing to say you've been within six feet of an individual for greater than 15 minutes. Uh, and so it's really important for us uh, to identify uh, those groups of folks um, because they're, again, at increased risk uh, for developing uh, COVID-19. And now we'll look at other news making headlines. The state reached somber new milestones this week from the coronavirus. The health department reports deaths in Louisiana from the disease surpassed 2,000 and cases 30,000. In addition, more than 20,000 of those infected are now presumed recovered. This year's French Quarter Festival and Satchmo Summerfest are officially canceled. This completes the coronavirus pandemic sweep of all major New Orleans festivals for the year. Satchmo is typically held in August. The French Quarter Fest had been moved to October from April. State Insurance Commissioner Jim Donilon sent a letter to all car insurance companies active in the state asking to give drivers a break. In this pandemic, credits and rate cuts from the top 18 companies total about $187 million in premiums returned to customers. That's small in comparison to the more than $4 billion in total premiums written in 2019. Governor Edwards this week announced the state has committed more than $10 million in grants to New Orleans to support nine affordable rental housing projects. All were at risk of losing funding because of the pandemic. The Office of Community Development will oversee the funding. Nearly every woman in one state prison dormitory has tested positive for COVID-19, even though two-thirds showed no symptoms. As of early this week, 192 of the 195 women in the unit at Hunt Correctional in St. Gabriel tested positive for the virus. A survey from LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication shows a majority of people in the state are following the governor's stay-at-home orders. The report found 75% of Louisiana adults say they very often wash their hands with soap for at least 20 seconds each time. 50% say they disinfect frequently used surfaces in their home very often. 84% say they maintain at least six feet of distance from others, and a majority have intentions of wearing face coverings. The president of Bessie says the board plans to choose a new state superintendent of education by May 20th. Sandy Holloway says after committee meetings on May 19th, the board plans to name a successor to Education Chief John White from a list of six finalists. Republican lawmakers moving forward with an attempt to unravel the governor's stay-at-home order. They're taking aim at his restrictions to place and combat 
the coronavirus. When Edwards extended the order through May 15th, criticism began echoing from the GOP. They wanted a parish by parish approach to loosen restrictions that have closed most businesses and have led to high unemployment. Now, attempts to undermine the governor have varied, but one from House GOP leader Blake Miguez from Erath would strip the governor of his ability to penalize businesses that don't comply with the order. All this despite the state struggling with one of the worst coronavirus outbreaks and despite praise from President Trump with how the governor has directed the state. And Thursday, Republicans rejected a proposal that would require many Louisiana businesses to provide paid sick leave for their workers. This debate center stage now because of ongoing coronavirus pandemic. New Orleans Representative Matthew Willard, who's a Democrat, proposed this. It died in committee by a 10 to 5 vote. Republicans voted in a block against it, saying they are against putting a financial mandate on businesses. Twelve states have passed laws requiring paid sick leave for workers that from the National Conference of State Legislatures, but none of those states are in the South. When the doors to the Louisiana legislature swung open on Monday and lawmakers packed in, State Representative Edward Ted James was not among them. The 38-year-old who was hospitalized last month with coronavirus and pneumonia says he didn't feel comfortable going. He says some of the same lawmakers who are telling residents to stay home and social distance weren't even wearing masks. This was a scene Monday morning at the state capitol, the floor filled with lawmakers resuming their regular legislative session. Not there, Ted James. He says the House chamber is not safe. I still have concerns um, um, as I, I watch Twitter and, and different colleagues started sending me pictures. There are several of my colleagues that, that aren't, um, you know, we've already ignored social distancing guidelines and, and many of them aren't, aren't even wearing a mask. As protesters gathered at the Capitol demanding the state reopen days before the session resumed, James took to Twitter, spelling out his concerns. He says he's still not comfortable with the idea of being in a crowded room with other lawmakers. And he says he believes he knows why some are willing to go. You know, people are upset when I say this, but, you know, I think that when you look at the numbers of, of cases, you know, in certain areas, when you look at the high number of um, people, 70 percent of the deaths are in the African-American community, I think there's this sense out there that uh, coronavirus is discriminatory. And the problem is it, it will get anybody at any time. Um, and I, I recognize that some members come from parishes that have very few cases. Um, so I, I think they, they, their level of concern is um, a lot lower than, than than mine for someone who's gone through it and someone that lives here in Baton Rouge. Um, and I'm not just concerned about myself, my family, my district. I'm concerned about everybody. And this is why this is James at one of his lowest points last month in the battle of his life against COVID-19 and pneumonia, a battle that he says pushed him to the edge, nearly took his will to live. He says now is not the time to play politics. Decisions being made are literally life and death. It furthers people's lack in trust in government for us to be leaders and tell everyone else, stay home, don't open your business, don't go out, don't gather with more than 10 people. And then we go and gather in a room of 105 and many of us don't wear a mask. We already have issues here in Baton Rouge with with pastors defying the order to open churches. When they see you, when you see your legislators doing it, it invites other people to ignore the orders and, and what you're seeing is those folks that, that continue to say, oh, well, the numbers aren't trending like they were before. Ding dong, that's because we've been practicing social distancing. That's saying that it worked. Um, that's saying that we were right by listening to medical advice. And, and the medical advice, um, it, it's not partisan. F folks aren't asking um, when, when folks are going into the hospital. Well, they didn't ask me, are you a Democrat or Republican? Right. They, they just started to treat me. So um, unfortunately, this has become a partisan issue. James hopes the lawmakers that are there only take up measures that have to be heard. Let's not focus on trying to make good on campaign promises that we that we made um, last year. So putting lives at stake by going to the Capitol in 28 days to try to push tort reform is just irresponsible. So for my, my colleagues that are there, you know, I know that it's important. Um, I have some bills 
um, that while members are there, other members decided to carry my bills for me. Um, and I will say again, many of them can wait. You know, I think that's a disservice to the people that, that we serve um, to go out there and push these issues that we've always pushed and say that it's COVID related because, you know, quite simply, I could be pushing my bill to legalize marijuana and I could say, you know what, I know it's going to bring in revenue and we know that we're going to be losing revenue because of all of the money that we spent. So let, let's legalize marijuana and, and bring in another revenue source, but I'm not going to do that because it's disingenuous. He says the bottom line, there's no place he would rather be, but he says right now is not the time to be risky. You know, folks, folks that know me, they know how much I absolutely love being in the Capitol, I look forward to legislative session. I get excited. Outside of football season, I'm usually really bored in Baton Rouge, so I get excited <laughs> when my colleagues are here. You know, I thrive on even some of the, the, the games that are being played now. You know, I've, I've said it. You know, I'm, I'm good at playing those games, but there, there's a time when you, when you, you just got to call time out on political games and advance on what's important to the state. Legislative leaders say they've taken steps to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, like temperature checks at the Capitol door and plexiglass dividers between the desk on the House floor. The regular session ends June 1st, and lawmakers have until July 1st to pass a budget. College campuses are usually some of the most active places in the state with work or events from early to late at night. They've been just the opposite as the coronavirus has changed our world. No classes, no workers, no activities, no sports. All are now moving toward bringing them back to life. They're doing so with great care. By the time a phased reopening begins, LSU's flagship campus will have largely been closed and quiet for more than a month. President Tom Galligan says the return of people to campus will come in four phases. The trigger, Andre, is when the uh, governor lifts the stay at home order or modifies the stay at home order. <clears throat> and then what we've asked is, is for folks to um, recommend who they th think needs to be back on campus up to 25 percent of the total workforce. Uh, as always, safety will be our guide. Um, and what we will say is we will say, if you can still work at home remotely, please continue to work at home remotely. But we've got some labs, um, some research projects that we really want to get back up and running. Galligan says key factors driving phase one will be the mitigation of resurgence and protection of the most vulnerable. Employees must maintain physical distancing, wash hands per CDC guidelines, and wear face coverings when the job puts them within six feet of others. Before we move to subsequent phases, we're going to make sure that we've safely implemented the prior phase. The Southern University system is following a similar path. And each campus is going to look a little different based upon what's going on in their local areas. Uh, New Orleans is obviously a little more different than perhaps Shreveport and even Baton Rouge, but also recognizing that all three are in major metropolitan areas and certainly working in accordance with the governor and the mayors in each of those areas just to see what is the best way to bring our campuses back. Southern LSU and the University of Louisiana system campuses plan to welcome students in the fall. How is the financial situation for the universities? You know, it, it's, it's, it's tough, right? Uh, we've, we've had some extraordinary expenses associated with uh, the transition from, uh, from online to, or from, from in-person to online courses. Uh, you know, of course, we, we reimburse students for uh, uh, part of their room and board uh, for the spring semester, so it's a decrease in revenue. All of the leaders are keeping a close watch of the legislature. They realize that our graduates eventually become taxpayers. And so if you want to, to uh, fulfill the, the economic needs of the state, you have to have a quality workforce. You have to have learners, knowledge workers that are, that are in that economy, powering that economy. There are a number of uh, legislative instruments that we were watching already and uh, definitely chiming in on. And of course, the most important being our appropriations legislation and what that's going to look like for the upcoming fiscal year. We will urge the legislature and the governor, and I, th I think that they both, they all understand it and agree um, to please remember how important higher ed is. There's a hiring and spending freeze at LSU, and 40 of its foundation staff of about 140 have been let go. 
The LSU Foundation is the university's main fundraising arm. Do you think that COVID-19 has exposed cracks in, in systems across the board? Yeah, I think it probably has. And I think the, the biggest one probably is for us as a society, um, why weren't we more prepared for this? Also talked with media representatives at Tulane. Tulane and other New Orleans-based universities are also planning to welcome students back in the fall, but a return of workers to the Tulane Uptown campus, that is in discussion right now, exactly when that would be. I might note the downtown Tulane Medical Center and community has largely remained in place during the pandemic. For nearly 40 days, Marie Carney has lived in fear that the coronavirus might take her life. Her fears growing as symptoms were getting worse. Now feeling a little better and hopeful she's on the other side, she has a message she hopes will help others avoid going through something she says she wouldn't wish on her worst enemy. Marie Carney says for the last 38 days, her life has been like a roller coaster that would not stop. So you basically have had a fever off and on for more than 30 days. Never lost it until two days ago. It was Two days ago was the very first time I've had a normal temperature. So when you first started getting these symptoms, they weren't normal COVID-19 symptoms, so you couldn't even get a test, right? Correct. Okay. I, was, I had called the CDC. I called my local health unit, and both of them said that I didn't fit the profile. But it was like nothing I had ever experienced before, ever. And I knew it. Within a day or two, I realized it was COVID-19. I had read already that there were intestinal issues that were showing up when other symptoms didn't show up. But I, I think it took 10 days for me to get a test. Carney says the experience has been nothing short of terrifying at times, and she knows she's not totally out of the woods yet. It took me a good two weeks or more to come to the conclusion I was most likely going to survive it. Two weeks of wondering as she waited to fall asleep, would she be taking her last breath? Would she make it through the night, living alone in total isolation and possibly worst of all, dying alone? I called people that I hadn't talked to in a long time, never told them I was sick. I wanted to leave them with a nice thing to remember me by. So I did that. Since then, some of them have found out that I have been sick, but, and I never said goodbye. It was just, I wanted a good memory for them and for myself. So that's what I did. You basically called your friends to kind of have a final conversation with them because you were so worried that you might not make it? Yes, uh, I am 68 years old. There are a couple of minor underlying issues health-wise that everything is so uncertain with this disease. You don't know what's going to happen, and it happens so quickly that I thought perhaps it would hit me in such a way that I would not have a mild case, that I would possibly die. It was a very real concern, and it was very hard to think, I'm going to be alone when I die. What, there's no obituaries being given out. I know people who have died in my circle of life. There's nothing. Unless you hear about it secondhand from somebody, you don't know that anybody has died. It's hard enough living alone, but then you're going to die alone, and nobody's even going to know it. And from everything she has researched and read, Marie believes that even after she's able to return to a normal routine, her health and well-being may never be the same. I personally believe that my neurological, psychological, everything has changed in ways that I would never have expected. But I also believe that a fever for this long will have to have some effect on your body. Marie says her COVID-19 experience has been life-changing, and she hopes to be a voice for others like her who struggle day after day in their homes alone with just their very scary thoughts. If you're sitting alone and you're afraid all the time, it's, it's much more difficult than just a normal aging process. It's, it's so quick. Here today, you're fine. Tomorrow, you're sick. And maybe the next day you're dead. So you have to have an advocate. And I've always advocated for people who don't have a voice. And I think at this point we need to communicate the long-term effects that could possibly be happening to us. I've experienced it. I'm going to experience it because even when the fever goes away, they're telling me three weeks at least before I feel somewhat normal. So it's a, you're talking close to a three-month process, minimum. 
I think we need to talk about that. Marie says she wants to emphasize the significance of the effects of being alone as you battle this illness. She says, if you don't have immediate family members nearby, a few occasional text messages just aren't enough. She encourages everyone, if you know someone fighting COVID-19, home alone, call them, bang on their door. Just let them hear your voice to let them know that you care. As the coronavirus invaded our world, a Dallas couple with Louisiana roots wanted to do something that could make a difference. Inspired by their two teenage daughters, what they came up with is simple, but its impact could be profound. The idea that made these bands happen, and I'm probably <laughs> wearing mine right here. I'm glad right. to see you're wearing them. We're of course wearing ours too. And we have two girls and we used to, when they were little, we used to give them little rubber bands as little reminders to eat your carrots or something when you were at school. As they were starting to go out towards classes, once, once this started, and I was still taking the kids to after school classes and everything, I wanted to put those rubber bands back on their arms. And don't just don't forget to wash your hands. And I would sell, tell them as they were getting out of the car, please wash your hands. Don't forget to wash your hands. Once your hands are on the ballet bar, wash your hands afterwards. Right. Once we started thinking about, well, maybe other people are having this kind of conversation in their family. Hey, remember to do this, remember to do that. And we thought, okay, well, the band could be a great way to help people remember. It's, it's, a, it's on your arm. It's a great way to remember to wash your hands. But also, it's a great way to raise money for COVID causes. We're starting out this first month. We kind of we're, we're kind of food specific because it's such a huge need right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, food banks being overwhelmed across the country with so many millions of people being unemployed all of a sudden. Uh, we have two of the three charities are are food related, and one is kind of is PPE related. So the, and the charities are national charities that are vetted and well known. It's you know, Meals on Wheels. Uh, it's Feeding America food banks, and then uh, Direct Relief, which is for PPE for first line responders in, in hospitals and so forth. The website is wsh20.com so it's wash 20 but without the a wsh20.com it's a cool thing bands a fun thing to have and so. uh, it'd be great to see these across the country and and giving back we would really love to make a huge difference it would That's make it yeah, yeah to help people just wash their hands and to give back would be a dream so we appreciate you having us thank you those bands are $3.50 a piece. Much more information and details on the website, on colors also. Check out their website at wash20.com. What a great idea. Now we shift off coronavirus now to one of the shining coastal restoration projects, Queen Bess Island. Yeah, in the summer of 2018, with BP settlement money, restoration work began to build back a vital water bird colony, including the fourth largest nesting habitat for our state bird, the brown pelican. This February, Wildlife and Fisheries and the CPRA completed the project, expanding it from 5 to 37 acres. Gabe Giffen has the story. Over the last 10 years, we've lost about half of our brown pelican colonies. And that's significant because what we know about brown pelicans is traditionally they return to the same location to nest. So as those islands deteriorate and fragment and disappear, that nesting habitat is gone. Those birds, they try to return to that spot and it's gone. Queen Bess Island is one of the largest pelican nesting areas in the state. The island had received restorative efforts in the 90s, but by 2019, the island was primarily underwater and only providing five acres of usable nesting habitat. As funding became available from the 2010 BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, LDWF and CPRA teamed up to formulate a project to restore Queen Bess Island. We know a lot about wildlife and fisheries, uh, but they know a lot about restoring the coast. So taking our expertise and blending it with, with theirs, um, how do you restore a pelican colony? All these things haven't been done before. It's, it's been a fantastic experience to bring our different areas of expertise together. So when we started out the project, first we established new design criteria and that's where we absolutely had to pair with wildlife and fisheries, the bird experts who understand the habitat needs of the population that this island is designed to serve. The island has been nourished with sediments from the Mississippi River and split into three different cells for a total of 37 acres of restoration. Part of the original island's nesting grounds remained intact, with the majority of cell one receiving nourishment with the runoff from the nearby sand placement. 
The adjacent area, cell 2, was refilled with sediments and then planted with native shrubs like marsh elder and matrimony vine. Over time, these shrubs will be large enough for birds to nest in. The bales of hay were placed between the rows of plantings to trap the lightweight sands that shift each day with the wind. Cell 3 has been transformed from an open lagoon to premier habitat for shorebirds like terns and skimmers that prefer a rocky shell bottom to build their nests on. Beyond Cell 3, breakwaters have been placed just off the south side of the island to provide a calm area for young birds to access water. As the project was nearing completion, a ceremony was held on the island to dedicate Queen Bess Island as the latest wildlife refuge in Louisiana. Our job today is to officially reopen this island for the return of the birds. And as I mentioned, I hope they are listening because this is their formal invitation to come back. On a day in March, Katie Freer and Todd Baker would visit the island to see if pelicans had returned. It's like there's one bush and they're all, they look like they're trying to get on one bush. <laughs> it's like... Ten years ago, you know, this island was a mess. We were picking up a lot of birds and now today we have nesting happening uh, and a lot more habitat for those guys into the future. So, good project and thankfully the birds agree. For Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries, this is Gabe Giffen. Gabe, thank you for that. Great to see it. That's our show for this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime with our app. Download it for free from your app store. This upgraded version features news, public affairs, documentaries, how-tos, and many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Mora. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.